From the American Society for Microbiology, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 154, recorded on June 4th, 2017. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Today we're coming to you from ASM Microbe 2017. It's in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we are in the poster and exhibit space. It's a big warehouse-like space. There are lots of exhibits here and people talking and milling around. And that's why the noise level is a little higher than usual. But as Ray Ortega would say, just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to have the entire TWIM crew with me today. You can tell this is a microbiology meeting because all the microbiologists here. And, and let me tell you who they are. All the way on the left the air, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Welcome to TWIM. Welcome to New Orleans. Everybody been having a great time? We have an audience, too, that Vincent hasn't <laughs> acknowledged. So, so say hello, everyone. Well, I was going to introduce them one by one. <laughs> You're in. Oh, that one will be out of time. All right. Next to Michael, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Nice pleasure. to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Your Always best. is. Nice to see you in vivo. In vivo. <laughs> in vivo. In vivo. <laughs> Next to Elio, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Welcome. I'd also like to say hello to Joe Handelsman, a former member of the TWIM team who's oh, here. She left. Joe, you can come up. <laughs> 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 you miss us, but no. <laughs> and we have a very special guest today. He is not an astronaut. <laughs> not yet. We had an astronaut yesterday, but this man is uh, tied to Earth. He is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. He's Chair of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology and Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Arturo Casadevall. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent. Good to have you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, you know, this is your second appearance on TWIM. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, about four or five years yes. ago. We were right. talking about biodefense then, right? We were talking about um, antibiotic, resistance. Antibiotic, resistance. antibiotic resistance. And it was, I think, at ICAC. Yeah, I remember. So, um, when you were in New York for many years, did you know Bloomberg at the time? Is that why you have this chair? No? No, it's uh, Bloomberg made a very generous gift yeah, yeah. to the university that allowed them to recruit uh, 50 professors. And you're and, one of them. And I'm one of them. So you've been there about two years now? Is that two right? and a half years. Okay, and then I know before that you were at Albert Einstein. I was uh, most of my professional life at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a wonderful place that I miss very much. You miss New York too? I miss New York. Yeah, well we miss you. <laughs> And tell us uh, what you, where you were before that. I think you spent a lot of time in New York, right? Right. So prior to that, I w did my residency uh, at Bellevue Hospital. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I did uh, my MD and PhD at New York University. And prior to that, I went to the only school I could afford, which was the City University, Queens College. It was free at the time. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, City University. Not sure I can get educated nowadays. All right. So how far back can we go? What about before that? I went to high school in Astoria, Queens. Right. And before that, uh, you are in, Dayton, in Dayton, Ohio. And before that, you're in Cuba. Cuba. And that's as far back as we go. That's I don't know how much further. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to ask him how he got his original microbiome during birth? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Have you been back to Cuba since you left? No, no. I haven't been back since I left. And you might not be able to. I don't know. I don't want to tempt it. Yeah. So uh, when you, you did an MD-PhD, you said, what, right. what were you working on? So uh, I was very interested in physical chemistry, so I trained in phage. We worked on using light scattering to understand how DNA is packaged and filaments as viruses. Right. Nice. Who and did you work with? A guy called Lauren Day. He uh, is retired now, but he's did terrific work on the on this system, and in fact, the structure of M13, how the DNA is packed and all that, you worked a lot of that out. Still very up-to-date questions, aren't they? Yeah. And as a postdoc, what did you work on? My, for my postdoc, I went to Einstein, and there I worked with Matthew Scharf yeah. on, uh, on immunoglobulin genes. 
Now, uh, Arturo has a really nice uh, record of publications uh, in science, of course, but we're not going to talk about that today because the other thing he does write about is all about science policy. Uh, a number of years ago on TWIV, we talked about a series of papers you wrote with Farrakh Fang uh, on how to fix the problems with science. And if you and you you have to look at his uh, his papers on PubMed because they're full of very similar publications. And so I picked four that I wanted to touch on today. I don't know if we'll get to all four, but he told me he's read them all just this morning. So uh, he's up on. I, I was cramming. Since cramming. I forgot what was in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have four of them. They're all really interesting. And the first one is uh, called the pathogenic potential of a microbe. Now, let me understand this. This is the pathogenic potential is, is meant to replace virulent measurements. Is that right? Well, it's a way of comparing it. Uh, virulence is a is a measure. Virulence is always measure relative to something. You measure it relative to a strain, to a knockout. It doesn't have an absolute number. This is a formulation that allows you to come up with a number that you can compare across species viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and um, um, it actually, I think it works. You think it works? Okay. Yeah, I think it works. Like everything, all knowledge in science is provisional, so <laughs> at least it worked up to now. Now, have you been thinking about this for a long time? Because yeah. obviously you just published yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I've been thinking about it for a long time. We, in the early, uh, late 90s and early zeros, I worked a lot with Lizanne Porowski to develop something called the Damage Response Framework, and one of the tenets of it is that you should focus on the outcome of the interaction. People like people call microbes pathogens, commensals, symbionts, and I think that when they do that, they give it a trait that is not their own. One cannot have a pathogen independent of a susceptible host. So the idea here was to be able to, to come up with a mathematical form formulation that allowed comparison. And um, I, there was, I was able to find numbers in the literature for mice, so it allow comparison mm. of 30 or 40 organisms. So what, what's wrong with our beloved old LD50? <laughs> the problem with the LD50 is that it's not very discriminatory. In fact, you can find papers in which the LD50, you can vary the inoculum by tenfold and the LD50 remains the same. Would you tell us again what an LD50 is? The LD50 is the lethal dose that will kill 50% of the animals. The other problem with the LD50 is that it, do, it doesn't work if the organisms don't cause death. How do you compare organisms that don't cause death? Well, you could call it um, infectious dose 50. You could call it infect. You need to have a readout of some sort, yeah. I mean, there are certainly other readouts besides death, you know, time, fever, weight loss. Weight loss. Other things right. as well. Yeah. But it's all things that you can measure, of course. Right. Mice or whoever animal it is can't tell you what's wrong with them or how they're feeling. That's right. So in the pathogenic potential formula, if there is no death, I worked in a parameter such that it reduces to one. You can mm -hmm. still compare it. That's why you have the mortality to the... The other okay. issue is when you culture the organism in the lab, the mm -hmm. organism often loses its virulence potential. And depending upon how many cycles you have carried that microbe in the laboratory, it may no longer cause the same level and effect mm -hmm. in those animals or whatever system you happen to be using. And so that's what leads to the variability between labs and unless you all have the same frozen stock from the beginning and you've only cultured it for that set period of time and you all can agree together. That's correct. So Arturo, can you uh, walk us through this formula? Do you remember it? Yeah, it, what it does is the pathogenic potential is basically the fraction symptomatic over the inoculum. One of the key things is that the inoculum makes tremendous difference. You know, where you call an organism pathogenic or non-pathogenic, you could always make it pathogenic mm -hmm. by increasing the inoculum or reducing the resistance of the host, getting an animal immunosuppressed. And then it gets multiplied by a factor of mortality to the uh, 10th power, such that if there is no mortality, you end up with a, a, a you multiply by, by one. The, um, one of the, uh, 
interesting things is that there are two tables in the paper. One of them has all these organisms on mouse data, and you could just rank them and depending on the, on the pathogenic potential, but there is no breakpoint. That is, there is no point at which you would have, for example, a discontinuity. All these organisms are continuous, and to me, that suggests that any, any calls to, to differentiate organisms from pathogenicity are essentially arbitrary on a continuous capacity to cause virulence. The second table varies the mouse strain, and what you can see is that you take the same inoculum, you vary the mouse strain, so the pathogenic potential is dependent on both. Okay. And, and not a little bit, over logs. Huge, yeah. Yeah, 100,000 right. times right. difference. One of the other factors you take into account is transmissibility, right? So we, I left transmissibility out of the, the basic formula. The reason for that is transmissibility is related to virulence in a very complex manner, it, and it's microbe-specific. In the case of tuberculosis, you need to have disease to have transmissibility. You can be PPD positive and yet not be transmissible. In other organisms, you could have great transmissibility and have very little virulence. An example would be like VK virus. A lot of us carry this stuff around mm -hmm. and, we, and it has no symptoms unless we become sick. So the, so the formula can be modified for transmissibility okay. if you are interested okay. in that. Oh, so you actually mentioned how you yeah. do that in the paper. Yeah. And also the element of time, right? Right. How long so if you, if you have you know, something like uh, HIV infection or cryptococcus or meningococcal and, uh, uh, sepsis, the mortality, if you wait enough time, the mortality is 100%. Mm -hmm. Yet we don't consider them equally fulminant. One will kill you over a decade, the other one will kill you over a year, and the other one will kill you in two days. So if, you, if you're interested in the element of, of fulminant, how fulminant it is, the formula can be modified by dividing by time, and that can be introduced. Right. So how is it selling? <laughs> I don't know. It, I, it was published in February. It was published. Yeah, I got some emails, and I got some, and people were interested. But we have to see. So, so let's assume everybody does adopt this. How is that going to make uh, science better? Um, how will it improve communication or experimental design? Well, I don't know. Uh, it, it will make it a science better. I think it will make thinking better uh, in, the, in terms of it because I think that even uh, people can actually speak across fields since you have a way to communicate across fields. Uh, when, for example, how would you compare the virulence of a virus to the virulence of, of a bacteria or a fungus? Uh, and it also, but I think that it what it does is it, it takes you right in front of the fact that at the end of the, of the day, you have an interaction between two entities, a host and a microbe, and you cannot really separate this outcome. Even though many people who work on pathogenesis torture the microbe and keep the host constant. Mm -hmm. Think about it, they use the same mouse strain, they create knockouts. If you go to an immunology lab, they keep the host, the microbe constant, and they torture the host. <laughs> right? Yeah. Very, Absolutely. very different. Uh, Absolutely right. Yeah. Very, very, and That's this how is... you can tell which lab is which. Which <laughs> lab is which, right. <laughs> and uh, so your, your recommendation would be to have people try this, but That's maybe right. they're nervous, so they, they can use their old way of measuring with this alongside it. That's right. That's right. You know, the, the beauty of the formula is that it can take your LD50 data that you have, even if not all your animals died, you know, you do an LD50 experiment, but what mm -hmm. happens if you only get 10% death? Right, right. Uh, and you can right. plug it in, and you can get a number, and you can use it. By the way, I should tell you that if you have questions, we have a mic here. You just have to raise your hand. If you're listening online, facebook.com slash ASMFan, you can type a question in, and we'll try and answer it if we can. One of the interesting parts of this paper discussion was uh, that you say there's no clear defining line between a pathogen and a non-pathogen. That's what, right. What do you mean by that? So, so, what I mean by that is that people have a need to categorize things. They want to call things, this is a pathogen, this is a non-pathogen, this is a saprophyte, this is a commensal, this is a symbiotic. And I think when they do that, which we do for everyday purposes and on it, you're making an error that these, or these buckets don't really exist, they exist in your mind, uh, that you can, you can always, since, since you can change 
the susceptibility of the host, or you can increase the lethality of the organism by increasing the inoculum. There is no dividing line. So you really should not be thinking about commensals, pathogens, opportunists, saprophytes, symbionts. You should only think about microbes and hosts. You take two entities, you put them together, and then you get a new state. And that state can be pathogenicity, that state can be symbiosis, that state can be commensalism. But now as you change the variables, you can move along states. And that is a very, very different way to look at the problem that as many scientists do. So I think conceptually, as I, would, I pointed out to Michelle, the formula, once you digest its implications, will hopefully make people think differently. And if you think about it, we already have that built into our mindset because any second year medical student appreciates that if you're immune compromised, an exposure to a microorganism will actually require less microbes to cause frank disease. So it's, it's hardwired into the intuition of folks who routinely deal with infections. On the other hand, if you get a vaccine, it doesn't matter how many virulence factors it has. Mm, correct. It's equivalent to being an, a known pathogen, right? I mean, I'm old enough to have been immunized with, with vaccinia. A smallpox is not a pathogen to me. Period, it's not. It doesn't matter what it's loaded with. So Arturo, what do we do about beneficial microbes? As you know, we have made such great strides in the last five or 10 years. Um, we used to think all microbes were bad and they were, you had to wash your hands. That, cha that thinking has changed quite a lot. So, so, uh, so a microbe can, can be a beneficial microbe and then a, in, in a state. But if you, for example, change the immune response, if you lower it, the same microbe that was making vitamin K for you can now become that one called pathogenic. On the other hand, if you mount a disproportionate immune response, you could be at the same state. So I think that no microbe can be called pathogenic, beneficial, irrelevant, indifferent, without taking into account the state of the interaction. And that's a very, very different way of looking at it. So but we could, we could say for the typical healthy host, these guys are typically pathogenic. These guys are typically beneficial. That's still useful for teaching. I think I, I think people at the end of the day need classification, and I think one one can use classification to help them uh, work it out. But I think fundamentally that is an error in thought. I mean, if you if this allows you to say uh, a virus that is in all of us when we're healthy has a very low pathogenic potential That's correct. unless you get immunocompromised and that right. low potential will explode. That's correct. And, and it will also allow you to compare viruses and bacteria which we can't, can't do with assays for virulence, right? That's right. Compare them. So That's I like right. it. You can, actually, you can actually do your flu experiments and do your weight loss or whatever you're going to do and then compare them right. Right. to a bacteria and, and see where these things are relative to one So another. can I teach this in my virology course? Yeah, and if you get any criticisms, please send them to me so I can amend the paper. <laughs> so, I'm totally open. All science, everything is provisional. So you know? in, in the microbial, with bacterial infections, there's an assay out there that's looking at a host response. The procalcitonin is effectively a, a good metric of indicating whether or not someone is going down the sepsis path. But unfortunately, there's not an equivalent like procalcitonin for the viral events. So how does that then factor in? Can we lift out the procalcitonin data that people are using to forecast uh, the onset of sepsis beforehand? Uh, so you, you could define, so the, the way the formula is, it basically says fractional symptomatic over the inoculum. What your, your readout there is the procalcitonin it's a, it's a measure of the fraction symptomatic. I mean, I guess it could, although I haven't really thought through the, the implications of what you just thought. Well, it's, it's a way of, because once you fall down the septic, septic path, it's, it's really quick, quick, quick. You, you have to intervene in order to save the patient. And if you can identify it sooner, then of course you can have a better outcome. So it's understanding that threshold that you're trying to assign inoculum and it's really about how quickly the pathogen is multiplying within the patient. So Incidentally, if you know the other variables, 
for example, if you were to know the, the, the pathogenic potential, you can then calculate the inoculum needed yeah. for fraction symptomatic. So you can always just be a rearranged, it, it works simple right. algebra. So let's do an informal poll. Would any of you consider using Arturo's formula <laughs> to study the pathogenic potential of your virus or your bacteria? Just raise your hand. Yeah, we have a few takers. We have a few takers. Go. Oh. That's good. That's better, Ray yeah. Thank you. Great. You're going to do it too? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to uh, the second paper. This one is called Rigorous Science, a How-To Guide. All right. Why did you write this? So I want to say that the next three papers were written with Tarek Fang. And uh, the, we are indivisible. You know, the intellectual input from both of us, you can't separate it. We, we basically synergize one another. So I want to make sure that he gets uh, full credit for this too. I, we, one of the things that we do is we try to think about things that are going on in science and that paper was initially catalyzed when the NIH decided to come up with a definition for rigor. And the more we looked at the NIH definition for rigor, we thought that A was redundant. They, it seemed to have even some circular elements in it. And on top of that brought in issues of transparency and reproducibility, which to me seemed to me separate. So then we began our process. The way we work is one of us writes a draft and then we go back and forth until we are comfortable. And we realized, A, that scientists talk about rigor, but there was no, no discussion in the literature about rigor. Amazingly, it's something that has been taken for granted, understanding. And rigor, rigor mortis. Is rigor mortis. Is, uh, That's in the literature. <laughs> That's in the literature, right. Right. Everybody knows what rigor mortis is, is, right? Okay. They know it when they see it. They know it. Well, I'm not sure. You, rigor mortis, you, you see it. You have to feel it. <laughs> People get hot, stiff. So you, in your paper, you suggest the five elements of right. rigorous science. So what are those? Well, Do you want I, me to give you your paper here? You know, I actually wrote them down because I was worried that here. I wouldn't remember them. Uh, no, no, I got them right here. Oops, sorry about that. See, I, uh, I had to cram for my own uh, twin. So, <laughs> so we call it the, the rigor pentatope. That is the four, five elements that hold it up. Re redundancy in experimental design. That's the kind of things I usually do. You replicate, uh, but you also have to develop approaches that are robust. Sound and statistical analysis, a recognition of error. Do you have systematic errors? Do you have the potential error, things like cell lines, antibodies, the avoidance of logical traps. Logical traps are everywhere, and most people are not even trained to think about it. How many times have you heard, I did the experiment, the result was negative. That's not the mechanism. There are lots of logical traps in there. And the other thing is intellectual honesty, to, to recognize the limits into one, to, it's putting oneself into an experiment, and to and to be aware of the biases that can go into it. And our view is that rigor cannot be defined by any of these. You could, for example, be very precise, do the experiment a million times, but if you have confirmation bias or if you have a logical trap in it, that is not a rigorous experiment. On the other hand, so our view is that these things are synergistic and that they work off each other and that together these five elements gives you uh, the, the possibility for rigor. One of the things you said under the logical traps, which I think we ought to repeat, you say confirmatory evidence cannot prove an assertion, but contradictory evidence may disprove it. That's correct. And that's really important. That's correct. Many people say, I want to prove the hypothesis. You can't prove a hypothesis. Right. No matter, you know, you. No matter how many times the sun, this is Hume's problem, how many times the sun rises, he cannot predict that it will rise tomorrow. <laughs> Think about that. So the way I was taught is that the rigorous scientist designs experiments to prove themselves wrong, not yeah. to substantiate what they already think. Right. Well, that's that, the null hypothesis. Right. Yeah. So that's included into, into one of the pillars of the, oh, of the definition. Right. Yeah. But the issue of reproducibility is independent. You could have, you could measure gravitational waves, for example. That's a one in, th in time event. Just because you measure it with great rigor doesn't tell you about the reproducibility of the next gravitational wave. 
So the NIH definition mixed in reproducibility and transparency and created a very complex uh, for, uh, definition that I think doesn't work. Now, what are your thoughts about methods sections in papers? Because they have really changed in the time that I have been writing manuscripts. They've been almost relegated to the supplemental section. And in fact, in some journals, they are in the supplemental section. You know, this is part of the phenomenon of current day science. One of the many problems is precisely that, that when they tell you to get your methods down to two paragraphs for some of these high prominent journals, there is not enough evi uh, information there to reproduce the experiment. It's simple, uh, so that's a, a real problem. The other thing that some of my colleagues in the immunological field tell me is they're worried about the fidelity of the reagents, principally fetal calf serum. And when they start a long set of experiments, they literally buy the entire lot of fetal calf serum to eliminate that common variable due to differences in fetal calf serum. Right. I mean, think about it, fetal calf serum reflects what the cow was doing yes. before, before they killed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, what it ate, what time of year it was, and many of these re materials are often frozen <coughs> for years before you use it. Yeah. yeah. Now, in your paper, you suggest uh, how to deal, how to enhance rigor. So, we have five suggestions, again, a Pentateuch <laughs> suggestions, five pillars. Because you only have five fingers. Huh? Five <laughs> fingers, right. We can't count anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got it down to that level because that's exactly where it is. So today you can go through your graduate education, but you're not taught any didactically what is good science. You're supposed to learn it from your mentor in what is often a guild-like approach. But how do you know your mentor learned it? It's an example. For, for example, where are you taught if you do an experiment and you get a result, you need to do a dose response? Where is that? That is not taught. So if you look at the programs and how we teach science, we generally defer all the ways of science to what's going on in the laboratory. But we have 270 years of scientific revolution, and there are good practices in science that ought to be taught. So one of the things that we are doing at Hopkins is we have this program that we all just launched, which we call it putting the PH back into PhD in which, remember, you're all doctors of philosophy, not doctors of microbiology. Learn from your philosophy. So, um, in which we're trying to teach these things. So instead of taking a graduate student and putting them through a lot of very specialized courses that they will promptly forget, it's a lot, I think, better to teach them the fundamentals of this. So, didactic programs in good science, more training in, est in statistics, on mathematics, uh, very few programs require it. And yet everybody is doing p-values. Refocus journal clubs from findings to methods. So one of the things is, this will force journal clubs to get better because people will not be using single word journals. And then having that discussion, how did this paper get into? Fill in the blank. Instead, <laughs> right, which is mostly journal clubs yes, nowadays. Yes, most of the journal. So instead what they do is focus on the methods, the other thought is that there ought to be continuing education methods, for, uh, courses for scientists. So this exists in legal and this exists in medical, but a scientist may spend, uh, a scientist's life maybe six, seven, six decades, and there is no way to bring them up into, into other areas. Especially PIs. Right, especially the trainees us. come in and they've got the latest. Right. Yeah. And, and if you th think about it, the microbiome is more complicated than the human tax code. <laughs> and yet, every year there are refresher courses on how to efficiently use the U.S. tax code to get the most out of your income tax refund. And so you have a really good point. So I think that it would be really good to begin to develop a continuing science education curriculum to keep scientists up to date. It, it, in many ways, uh, as, as these things arise. That one strikes me as the hardest one to sell. The which? The hardest one to sell. Yes. Continuing education? Well, well yeah, I mean, most it, people I know are very comfortable with being perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Will you, you think of himself as being at least good more enough? perfect than the next guy? Yeah, right. I mean, why, why do I need an official course? We're well, not doing everything let's right. Let's take a poll. Let's see who would take a continuing no, education. No, no, no. Who of you thinks your mentor should take a, a continuing? <laughs> <laughs> Notice none of them are. No, 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 their mentors must. Their be. mentors are perfect. There's no camera on you, so you're okay. <laughs> no, no answer. Look at that. No answer. I would, one. Do it. would you do it? Michelle? I would do it, especially if I was required to do I mean, it. You can't say right. no. It's in certain areas, definitely. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. I think to, all, to some extent, we're all doing it by attending this meeting. Um, I was taught very early on: you don't go to all of the sessions for which you're already well acquainted. You go to something yeah. that you don't know, that you're not I comfortable I don't think with. that's what he means, though. No, He's not meaning more education. He means something else. I mean continuing he education to, to bring, you know, no matter what area you're in, I think that to bring you up and also to discuss, you know, one of the things that uh, we're developing in this course, science never look at its errors. Think about it. If there is an airplane crash, a train crash, an incident, it gets dissected and you learn from it to go forward. Instead, when we, we now have thousands of retractions in the literature. So instead of journal club, we're starting a course looking at the anatomy of error, in which you can learn a lot of science by seeing the problems on retractions. For example, you can teach someone that if you're gonna purify a new compound, you need to have two independent methods, and you can show them nine retractions from a lab in which every step involves sedimentation. So you can teach that. You can teach what happens when you don't validate reagents by showing retractions where the reagent that they thought was binding to one thing was binding to the other. So... I think you should publish a book. Well, we are in some way. We're okay. working on it All right. in, in doing this to, to try to teach a lot of this. You know. Yeah. So what do you have to say about the epidemic of retractions in bad science? Oh God, that would be another twin, right? It would be. It's not it on the list. It's not on the list. But I, I think on one hand, it's good that we, ha we have the capacity to correct the literature. On the other hand, it's bad because some of the f work that Farrick and I have done, including the paper that we published five years ago, showed that the overwhelming number of these retractions were due to misconduct. So it basically tells you that we have serious problems in the scientific enterprise. And the last one is to develop teaching aids to improve peer review. And I will tell you that the ASM and the Publications Board is beginning to do this. For example, with Elizabeth Dick and Farrick Fang, we did a study where we showed the inappropriate uh, duplication. So we are creating teaching sets that reviewers could look at what to look in a figure. That, you know, think about it today, Reviewers, how, how does a person become a reviewer? An editor asks you, do you get any training on that? What are you supposed to look for? So eventually, <laughs> it's like you graduate from the club. ranks of reviewers. Mm -hmm. If you turn it in on time, you're a good reviewer. <laughs> it's the same, it's Where's same, the data for any of this? It's the same problem with uh, grant review. Right, oh, please, of course. You get asked by someone, you right. go, and you try and impress everyone by finding all the problems right. <laughs> with the proposal. Right. The so wrong. In but science, it's easy to be critical. The pH was wrong. The pH was wrong. Right. <laughs> In science, it's easy to be critical. As long as you're critical, no one uh, criticizes you yeah. too much. But you know, it's more important to recognize what's good and to defend it. And when you can do that in front of others, you know that you have advanced. So the, this issue of reading a paper in a journal club from the, from the methods viewpoint, not from the conclusion. Right. So, so we try and do this on twin, right? But maybe not enough. Maybe we should do it more. I know on TWIB we try and talk about how things are done, not so much as the methods. Is that what do you think? Do you think we do it enough? It can get tricky because some of the methods are so advanced that yeah, it won't really yeah. um, be interesting to our broad audience. Yeah, and they're not radiogenic, where they'll they'll yeah. come across in an audio format only. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if it's the right forum. He, he, Arturo is suggesting to do that in a, in a journal club. I'm just trying to contribute. But I, I think for us, the, 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 the broad conclusions are important to convey, especially to a non-science audience. Right. right. I mean, I, I, one of the things that we're going to try to pioneer is this analysis of error. This is simply not done in any aspect of science. 
and yet we have now 6,000 retractions. You can teach ethics from retractions. You can teach what happens when you, leave, when you leave an author out. You could see, you could teach what happens when you take data from others without attribution. There is a lot that can be learned by looking at the, and, and I think no one would argue that a retraction is an unequivocal indication of some error because the paper is retracted, all the work is lost in that case. So here's the problem I see. So you're starting a program at your place, but every other place is different and really independent. There are no standards in PhD and postdoctoral pro programs. So how would you get everyone? Actually, I think that one of the real problems today is that PhD education is very homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So think about it. Almost any place you go, they basically put you through some specialized courses, they give you a qualifying exam, and they send you into the laboratory, and then it's a free-for-all. And one is really not taught, taught the ways of science. And I think this could be standardized and we could, we could train people better and that will reduce the error at the other end and we reduce uh, the problems with reproducibility and things like that. We don't take science education that seriously. We extent, think we know what we're doing. To what extent do you think this is compounded by the existence of very large labs where supervision becomes diluted? Well, that's true. On the other hand, you know, like everything in life, in a, in a large lab, there is the opportunity for more interactions. And people often find that other people, the mentor can be a, a student, uh, a senior student or a postdoc. But what I would argue is that the system is random. And we need to do better in training our scientists. So what you're arguing for is a discussion that's going on in the undergraduate curriculum market right now That's and right. what they're all advocating from physics to biology is for competency inventories and so what you're suge suggesting is that the the doctorate of philosophy have a, a competency inventory that you must be competent in the following subject areas in, in and so you, and the concepts that you want them to be uh, aware of are associated with that, those five pillars that's that you have set up. That's and I don't think that's placing a burden on any PhD program because they are earning a degree in a doctorate of, of philosophy. philosophy. That's right. And they need to know where their problems are and they need to know how to work the system to effectively solve their problem. Michael, you're absolutely right. I think that this uh, we, our goal is to get this thing going at, at Hopkins and we are going to hopefully make the materials available and perhaps others will be interested. And in fact, the ASM right. is um, interested in contributing uh, through right. the American Academy of Microbiology uh, colloquia that will be chaired by Arturo. We'll invite people that are experts in education to come to ASM headquarters and to really chew these ideas, um, That's right. chew on these ideas and uh, produce a, uh, will it be a short report? A, a report on how to go, by the way, the National mm -hmm. Academy of Science is looking at it too, and right. we're teaming up with them. Uh, these are issues that haven't been looked at. I mean, everyone, what's remarkable to me is the homogeneity of programs. Uh, and, and yet, every PhD student has a different experience because once you go into the lab, the experience is totally different, and you could have a lot of mentoring, and a lot of care, or you could have none. So in medicine and dentistry, the determinant of conferring a degree, doctorate of medicine, doctorate of, of dental medicine, they have to, the sole criteria is the ability to independently practice. And that effectively is what we anticipate when you go to your first postdoc. Your postdoctoral mentor assumes that when you enter their laboratory, you will be a partner with them in advancing the goals and ideas of the lab. So you're capable of independent practice. That's correct. That's absolutely right. I mean, I think that what we need to do in the graduate education, I, I w so what are we good today? We are really good at taking people and teaching them how to do deep work. That's not the problem. You take your, your any PhD student who completes a thesis knows how to do deep work. The problem is that they come out so specialized that they don't necessarily have, their, their bandwidth is relatively narrow. 
And I think that you can teach them to have a much bigger bandwidth by giving those tools that are currently not taught. Yeah. Are there any questions so far in the audience? Any online questions? We have an online question. Not yet? No. Not, not sufficiently provocative? Yeah, we have one here in the front. Why do we still call it Dr. Philosophy? <laughs> I, I think it's... Just historical. I think it is. I mean, because philosophy it, is it the... It enables you to get food and lodging for you and a horse at any monastery. <laughs> That's what the degree and it's title the of knowledge. Do. Excellent. Thank you. I'm curious about this idea of continuing science education. How do you propose, like, who would administer that and oversee it, and where would you get the credit? Like, You know, it, it will, it, I hate to say this, but it will have to emerge almost as an industry because this material will have to be developed, and there, has to, there will have to be a value added to this. You know, uh, study sections may require it. Uh, continuing to, to maintain itself. Today, they ask us to do continuing education in ethics, right? I mean, I have, and, and I think that you could imagine doing something like that in some of the other aspects of science. And we similarly have IACUC yeah. IA training, we have biosafety training that we must maintain, right. and human subject training that we have to maintain and everyone has the annual training requirements. I mean, imagine, uh, imagine that you get a refresher on logical fallacies. That's just not done today. And yet, yet we walk with all these logical fallacies and we operate every single day on that. Just, just to remind ourselves that, you know, when you say there is no evidence for this in this system, you're using the, the argument from ignorance that was worked out by uh, Aristotelian logic. And, and so when we use these arguments, there's a logical fallacy. And yet we use them all day long in our discussions with other scientists and seminars and things like that. Just a refresher. All right, any others? Okay, next paper, funding by lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone laughed. Where do I buy a ticket? <laughs> all right, Artur, what, so, uh, what's this about? So uh, uh, this, this study, well, we, all of us who serve on study sections, I think, are amazed at the randomness of the process. And what happened was there was a paper published in Science in the fall of 2016 in which they looked over 100,000 uh, articles, and there was a very weak correlation that suggested that this, the grants that got the lowest score, that is the better grants, were more productive than the ones who didn't. But this looked at something like 40 or 50 <coughs> years of data and the numbers were enormous. And I and Farrick, we be, began talking. In fact, we had this discussion. Um, actually, the discussion began before the paper. We had a discussion in a New York restaurant, and then we wrote the article in the Wall Street Journal huh? mm -hmm. that basically yeah. argued for powerball, powerball funding. Powerball. But, yeah. Right. But then there was this paper out there with data. And we knew that, that serving the study sections that your typical study section cannot discriminate among grants very well. So what we looked at was the, the grants that are funded from zero to 20% only. And we found that the, that, that, you know, reviewers do as well as chance. That is, that are 19% funded and are 3% funded were indistinguishable. This was published in eLife uh, last year. And then we wrote the formal proposal. The formal proposal is that the current system, when reviewers sit around that table, is underpowered and biased. And there are multiple biases in it. I mean, I'll run through them. There is sex bias. So there is evidence that women do approximately 7% worse than men. There is racial bias. There is topic bias. The reviewers like their own field more than your field. Uh, there is cronyism. You know, I like Vincent. Uh, and then there is favoritism to established investigators. So all these biases come in, and when you have very tight pay lines, these things could probably affect the, the, the very much who gets funded and who doesn't get funded. On top of that, we have another problem. The power of the reviewer is proportional to the pay line. If you basically are funding at 60 to 70 percent, you could have an argument and the grant will get funded. Now, a person only has to sneeze around the table. 
and the area doesn't get funded. Think of the power of the individual to alter the course of a field, since, the, since it may be the only grant in one topic, and then when it goes, it won't come back for almost another year, and then they could sneeze again. So this basically tells you that the way that we are allocating the few funds is very problematic. So what we propose is, we propose we still have peer review. We re ask him to review the grants, but put them into two, pocket, two buckets, meritorious and non-meritorious, and then take the meritorious ones and then set some percentage for success. So if you're, you, uh, and then those go into a lottery. And the only body who gets critiques are the ones who are non-meritorious. Leave these people alone. Don't send them that garbage. You know, ruin their day. It's a lot easier to you go to your chair and say, you know, I keep making the lottery, but I haven't gotten funded, than to say, you know, I got an 11%, but the pay line was 10%, and the chair looks at you and says, Vincent, why can't you get below the 10% line? There must be something wrong in the system. But I think even deeper, it may, be, it may promote science in another way. That is, when reviewers give really good scores, it's because they understand it and because they like it. And I would argue that things that are very well understood probably are not the kind of science that is going to really be transformative. It may be that the more important science is in the bucket that is left because somebody objected. There was some tension that could not be resolved. So I think that because of biases and, and, a need, and potentially better science, the, the system ought to move to a modified lottery. The other element you had is that if you lost the lottery one year, you would stay in it right. and you wouldn't have to resubmit your grant. So a point you make is that we're spending a lot more time futzing with grants to try to get them from 17 to 14. That's absolutely right. Is there a question online? We do. Kim from Facebook asks, what does the panel think of the proposed NIH grant limits? Well, I mean, that's a separate question. I mean, if you design, because this is how do you would select the grants. If the, once the grants get funded, if there are going to be limits, they will fall in limits. But the two issues are completely separate. And the second question was, can you ask Vincent how the weather is? He forgot to mention it. <laughs> Well, here How is the in, weather? Here inside. Elio doesn't like us uh, to do the weather on... No, I live in San Diego. What's weather? <laughs> it's 72 and sunny every day. No, oh, it is uh, 31 Celsius and mostly cloudy. And I, I don't hear my mic working anymore. It's gone out. So, uh, so we... Oh, that you lost your, your wire. No, it's there. Oh, it is? No, it's not. <laughs> oh, it is. I have my wire. Well, then, uh, your batteries gone. Right. Thirty-one. Uh, well, let me let me say the obvious. Yeah. Uh, your proposal makes full sense and has no political legs. <laughs> <laughs> because as scientists, we need to convince politicians that this is the way. People find it very. They are very uneasy with the idea that you could do better with a lottery than otherwise. But the problem today is that we already have a lottery, but it's not random. Yeah. We already have a lottery. Your reviewer gets up, goes to the bathroom, and misses something, or somebody says anything. That's randomness. That's that's uh, so false on it. But but it's not. You don't not benefit from 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 true randomness. And it's probably because the study section doesn't know the proper method in order to evaluate because they not had their continuing education. You know, my sense is that scientists are probably are good at identifying really bad work, work yeah. that is shoddy or something like that. But when you ask them to rank work in priority, they, this is something they cannot possibly do. And yet yeah. we, and, and when the funding line was 50 or 60%, this didn't matter. When the funding line is 10%, it matters. Okay, do you have a question down here? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to blind the reviewers about who wrote the grant? It, so blinding has been done in, uh, in reviews, and there are blinded grants. But you know what happens is often the reviewer spends a lot of time trying to guess who it's from. <laughs> and actually, it's not that hard to guess. You just look at what they're doing, go to PubMed, and see what the citations are. Well, and we're also evaluated on track record. Right. So it's hard to 
take track record out of it and not name your papers. So that brings up, can you hear me now? That brings up another issue I wanted to talk about. You, you mentioned that different parts of NIH review the proposal differently. So the, why don't you tell us about that? So the NIH already has two very different types of review. If you are an intramural investigator, you're subjected to retroactive review. They looked at what you did in the past five years. They don't worry too much of what you're going to do. If you are an outside extramural investigator, you're judged by what you propose to do. And the truth of the matter is that if, if you, most scientists will tell you that they write a grant, and I'm going to see what the other ones think here. And inevitably, by the time you begin to work, things change so much, so the proposed project often doesn't have any relevance to what actually gets done. So a, a, a retroactive review uh, that is looking at what people have done is probably your best indicator of how they're going to do in the future. People that have been productive are more likely to be productive. People who have basically done good work are more likely to do good work. Now, that works for established people. For young investigators, we would have to have something different uh, in that case because they obviously don't have a track record. But uh, why do they have two separate systems of review? I don't know the answer to that. I think that may have to do with the way that the, these things evolve. Yeah. Again, let me, let me remind you historically, in the very old days, uh, the retroactive system was really what was working. It was used for extramural, but it's, it evolved because people kept saying, well, he did all right last five years. How do we know he's going to be all right now? So you ask people to write this baloney, which is, I'm promising you I'm going to do that. But in reality, that is very real reality. So the, the, the going away from the retroactive system cost a lot in terms of quality. On the other hand, it doesn't work for young people. There's no retroactivity. And so you have to adjust for that in some fashion. So I agree, and that, what Elio says remind me of one more thing. Something that happens today is that investigators are forced to write a significant section. I think that this is a catastrophic error because what it does is everybody tries to get their work into something that is utilitarian. You and, need, you need and, hip boots for right. that. And the most important work that you could be doing is probably work that you cannot imagine the significance of. You know, imagine general relativity. No significance in utilitarian up until you needed to correct for the GPS satellites. And now it's an example yeah, of that. Of so I, I think that this is, it dumps down science. When you say that you're interested in a basic science problem, and you have to write all that garbage, how this is going to be useful for drug discovery. Stick to the science. If it, it you know. It'd make the grant shorter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other issue I wanted to touch on was uh, this idea about grantsmanship and how it's prized, but it's not really related to a good proposal. It doesn't correlate to productivity right. subsequently. Yeah. It, well, I. I what the, I think the point that we try to make is that when you have a very tight funding and, and a U.S. scientist to rank, often they will rank grants that are better in grantsmanship. There is no evidence that grantsmanship has any relationship to, science, to scientific quality or scientific importance. You know, but if you have a better written grant that is, looks better, you're more likely to do better than if you happen to have left out a paragraph or something. That's, yeah. you know. So, so what does it say about courses that are offered everywhere to try and get you to be a better grant writer? Well, I think that those courses are trying to give you that edge yeah. in grantsmanship that everybody recognizes exist. That would not be an issue if you were dealing with much higher pay lines. Right, right. But if they're general writing courses, how can we be more clear about our science and its importance and, and how it fits in? I think that that's better for the literature not just grants, but... Yeah. Well, sometimes, as Arturo said, you don't know where something is heading. And, right. you know, you could probably look at the earliest CRISPR grants, and they had no idea sure. what... And they certainly didn't foresee using it for genome editing, right? Yet, some of them got funded, obviously, and they mm -hmm. went forward. But I think the significance is really hard. You could speculate, maybe. Is it worth speculating on it? You know, I don't know. I think that the moment that you ask a scientist, the, to me, the, the best science comes out of you. You take smart people, 
You give them money and you let them pursue their interests. Period. I agree. You just let them, and this, we have a lot of evidence I agree. that this produces revolutionary work. Right. Look what came out of Bell Labs. Look what has come out in people just pursuing their curiosity. Now tell them to pursue their curiosity, but I won't give you our money unless you give me a significant statement and you're already changing the course of what that individual would do. And look at, at just look at this auditorium and you look at the number of booths that we have that are using Malditoff. And when did Malditoff come out of ASM? It didn't, it came out of the American Chemical Society. And all of a sudden, all of those papers on mass spectroscopy, c coupled with the increase in computing power that came out of something else, when they put the two together, they got a revolution in diagnostic microbiology. So uh, that's a very good example. I mean, mass spec has been known for almost 100 years. And sequencing began to be done in the late 80s and took off in the 90s. No one anticipated. No one anticipated at the time that the marriage of the two, combined with computing power, will give you a transformative technology. The, you know, there were none of those people writing, I want to sequence the genome, was writing it because they anticipated that this will be diagnostic. Right. Well, there, there are tons of these yeah, examples, right? right? And but the point is that you can't predict. And so you have to do a, a lot of fundamental work which, of which you don't know the significance. But as you say, if it's a good investigator and it a good proposal. Um, How come they give me a know. microphone? How, why? Because the other one wasn't working and no one. His batteries. You want one too? <laughs> we were. Yeah, I want my microphone. You want your microphone? Uh, one, one last point before we move away from this. Can you tell us how you used examples from the financial world to guide this thinking? Well, you know, when you look at, at index fund, funds, it turns out that the, that it, that the market is full of examples where where you do best by just averaging out returns. That is, taking bets that average and, and actively managed funds don't do better. In, making, in fact, we put, have an example in the, in, the in the book that two out of 2,000 and something did better than if they had just did it, picked random stocks. So, it, look, we are not good at predicting the future. I, I, in fact, we're terrible at it. And I think when a study section looks at a perspective research plan, you're asking them to some degree to predict where this is going. I would rather take you, you have a track record, give you some money, pursue your curiosity. You get something done, I'll give you more money in five years. It's an indictment of the financial world. It's such a huge industry where they think they can predict what's Right, happening. well, I mean, all the references it's are random. there in that paper. It's random. All right, one last point I want to take from this uh, very interesting uh, paper. You say, and you quote someone, science is a low yield endeavor, but it has consistently helped humanity. And I think that's a great statement, we all agree. Really hard to convey to non-scientists, though. I, I, think that, I think that you ask him to take out their cell phone. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. how you do it. Absolutely. As you pointed out in, in South Carolina conference. Yeah, I, I did a science cafe in Charleston uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we, went through the prospect that the human microbiome has to offer. And the way I ended the talk, after taking them through from your first gift from your mother to the promise that we're beginning to understand the microbiome in autism to asthma to visceral fat, and I ended it lifting Kennedy's speech from 1962, talking about the moonshot. And I pointed out to them, this was President Kennedy's last budget, it was a month before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he ended up proposing three and a half percent of the federal budget go into going to the moon. So I asked the audience, and South Carolina is very conservative, tax-averse state, and I said, would you invest in something? And I lifted my cell phone out of my pocket and I said that something with that would give you this in 20 years, but from the perspective of human health. And to a person, they all agreed that it would be really swell if we invested the equivalent of the moonshot funds, which at that time in 1962, in today's dollars, would be $122 billion. Wow. Hmm. To give you a perspective, NASA's budget is only $18.5 billion in, in this president's budget, and NIH 
is between 31 and whatever uh, the president's budget ultimately suggests it will become. And to a person, they said, yes, let's do it. Yeah, well, you kind of fed them a line. You said, if it leads to this. I did. But the point is, we don't know what things but, lead to. But, 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 but they uh, didn't at the time either. Right. In 1962. I understand, but your audience happened. knew right, you told I, them. But I think you can say to them, look at life and look at all the problems yeah. we have. And, and science has the best track record in humanity in, in many ways to helping solve some sure. of these problems. Sure. And I said, okay. you got to take a risk. You drive every day, put some money into science. Well, speaking of moonshots, perfect lead into our last right. story. Hence the... The name of the paper, Moonshot Science. What stimulated... This is actually a letter, right? Well, it was an editorial. <coughs> uh, so I became very interested in Obama's... Um, the, the discussion about moonshot, the cancer moonshot. And the question is, when does a moonshot work? And it turns out that the moon should work, in part because the laws of physics have been known since the since Newtonian physics, relied on Newtonian physics, it relied on, on a lot of uh, aerodynamics and things that have been worked out already. So it was largely an engineering problem that gave us things like GPS, weather satellites, and all that. So when you begin to look at things that work, and then you can compare that to Nixon's war on cancer, where they, they decided they were going to put money into it that will cure cancer, and then people look back and say, well, that, the war on cancer failed. No, the war on cancer didn't fail. It led to a tremendous amount of work that benefited other areas, including, for example, HIV research and, uh, and, and virology, and things that wouldn't have happened if that money didn't go into it. So the point of the paper is um, that we don't know if cancer, the cancer field, is at the point where it is an engineering project. They may have enough knowledge to do it. We don't know that. But even if, the, even if they don't have enough knowledge to do it, and even if they can't give you a cure in 10 years, if the money is well spent, and it is spent in good science, that we will all benefit anyway. So what other successful moonshots have there been besides the moonshot and... Uh... Well, another, another good example is people say, you know, think about it. When I was, uh, when I was in medical school, there was no HIV. When I was a resident, 80% of my patients at Bellevue had HIV, and most of them died within two years. So, no, so 1981, HIV is first described. 84, the virus is found. 85, you have a test. 96, 87, you have effect, the first ACT, and then you have really effective antiretroviral therapy by 96. 13 years. People say the reason that happens so fast is they put a lot of money into AIDS. I disagree. The reason that happened is because society spent its very scarce funds in the 1960s and 70s studying a curiosity which was known as retroviruses. So by the time people knew that there was a retrovirus, they knew what the order was going to be. And they knew that if you interfered with the protease, you could deactivate the virus. So there, the moonshot work, that is mm -hmm. a moonshot. Why? Because the basic science, mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of it had been done. Right. DNA replication had been worked, had been worked out. out. Oh, sure, everything. So imagine yeah. if society had decided a significant statement, we are not going to fund any retroviral research because it doesn't affect humans. Mm -hmm. and, took, and not spend that money in the 60s, 70s. What would, what would have happened in 1981? 82. Right, and the other moonshot that worked was the genome sequencing. The project, genome sequence, right? right. That, the genome, which was based on previous based on work that you know the, the the DNA sequencing had been done. The basic science had been done, so it became largely an engineering project that allows you to generate even more sequence for less money. So you also say in this uh, opinion, even if we don't reach the moon, these moonshots can provide benefits. Right, you're still going to the stars. The you may not one. reach the moon, but provided you escape enough. <laughs> the other big moonshot was NMR that is now referred to as MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, how many people have had an MRI on their knee because they played basketball poorly? Sure. So again, that was a, a, a confluence of two technologies, right? NMR was known for a long time. I did it in organic chemistry and things like that. And then you needed computing power to be able to generate an image. Yep. Two things independent, and this is why society needs to spend broadly, because it is the confluence of technologies that can often give you something transformative. 
uh, so Obama was highly criticized in some some areas for proposing this and what do you think about that? So I think the people who criticized him were afraid. People are afraid of, many scientists were afraid of the hype. Mm. That, okay, we're going to spend all this money and we may not be able to deliver it. And you know what will happen? They'll cut off funds the next time. We shouldn't mm. be doing that. Mm. I think the answer is we should have said thank you. We're going to try. We may not get there, but we're going to do really good science and maybe other things will come out. ACT came out of cancer research. Or knowledge of, mm. of retroviruses came out of cancer research because they were interested in, in, in uh, murine uh, tumor viruses, uh, uh, mammary tumor viruses, sure. and feel. But the problem is that there's no more Obama administration, right? So what's going to happen to that moonshot call? Uh, I, th I think that, you know, I think we need to continue to be active. I, look, despite all the things you have heard, the NIH ended up with two extra billion dollars. This year. This yeah. year. And right. I think that that, I think people are aware of this, and I think we need to continue to be active. Right. So uh, these arguments I all, of, of course, agree with. But if you, sometimes you go out to the public, the non-science public, and they say, well, you just want to pay your salary and you have a job. That's why you're promoting this. So how do you combat that? I, I think that you, com you combat that by, by continuously pointing out to them the issues around them that need to be addressed and that will not get better. If in 1985, when I was an intern, or 1986, 87, we had maximized care, the patients will still die today. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say, let's just maximize things as they are. It was the combination of existing science and new science that, that led to that. And, and you can point out to them the, the problems and, and that we continue to make progress and that science needs to be supported, but needs to be supported broadly. Everything from physics down to, to, to psychology, because these things are synergistic. I also think that scientists can't just whine about we need more money. We are also, it's all of us, um, it is incumbent on us to explain the, the tremendous value that our science adds to education and, mm -hmm. to, and mm -hmm. to health and making the world a healthier place. I so also think that people like Alio, who are not doing science uh, right. at the bench, He's picking on you. could speak out and then you can't, people can't argue that you just want a paycheck because you're not getting paid. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Right. But, uh, and one of the okay, things I, that I Mary, <laughs> Mary Woolley said at her science advocacy, when someone asks you, what do you do? Mm. You say, I work for you. Beautiful. I love that. If you're on a plane and someone says, what do you do? I work for you. Just think. They're going to go, wait, what do you mean? And there you, that's your in. That's your in. It's beautiful. I love it. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Michael, what do you do? I work for you, Vincent. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Science is beautiful, of course, but you know that. We're preaching to the converted here. Uh, but this podcast, of course, goes beyond scientists, and that's partly why we do it, to try and bring people in and have them talk about why science is so great. Well, that is TWIM 154. Any online questions? No, that's it. Nope, Twin 150, yes. Question. Wait, we have a question here. You have a mic? Yeah, I can give you my mic here. This is like a game show. I'm coming down. <laughs> I was just wondering, what do you think would be the most effective way of trying to get to people to know, like, what do you do and why this is important? Like, the random people the, is going to ask you on the plane, what do you do? So what do you think is the most effective way of like reaching to that person? You can, you can take a page from uh, the well, Ted Primer. Right. You have to have an idea worth sharing. And you need to think about what your idea is. And then the sorts of things you do every day are the decorations. If you will, it's a Christmas tree. You go out and you pick the best looking tree and if you get a Charlie Brown tree that doesn't look so well and you bring home the Charlie Brown tree it's what you use to decorate it and so it starts with the idea and we all have great ideas and that's what the general public wants to know is what's your idea that you're working on for me because it's always about them and if you know that up front think about how your idea or what you're working on will affect them 
and then the appropriate elements that will decorate it so you they leave and what you want them to do is you want them to spread your idea you want it to go viral and Jeff Malloy has been doing some really great things during the sessions he's been condensing down what the plenary speakers have been doing in a tweet and so if you can get your idea down to that magic character limit but you'll have more than 147 characters to talk to that person on the plane if you can do that you'll generally have a convert I want to second Mike's point I one of the problems uh, scientists often then lecture or say so if you say to me what do you do I say I'm a scientist and I would turn it to the person and say hey what do you think about science and let them tell you uh, what are the problems you're interested in. And then let the discussion go along what they're interested in. Don't get into telling them how great microbes are. <laughs> or any of this no stuff. No one cares. You know, I mean, if they care, you can bring it in later. But if you focus on them, and then and, and you can get them to tell you, and you can point out that there is some aspect of what they're telling you that science can address, then as the discussion goes forward, you can tell them about difficulties in science, that it needs to get funded and all that. I like that. It's a good yeah. idea. So Turn remember, remember, yeah. I work for you and then I'm a scientist and let them let them ask the question. What question. do you think about science? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Any anyone else? All right. This is uh, Twim one fifty four. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, you can find it at ASM.org slash twim. And you should subscribe. You can do it easily on your smartphone or tablet. You have a podcast player. Search for TWIM. Subscribe. So you get every episode. Why not? It's free. And you can learn a lot from it. So Vincent, please do thank that. you for covering our papers. Uh, we are honored. And we'll have you back. We should talk about, um, what was that topic that came up? I forgot. What would you want? I think Whether grants should be limited, that was one. No, oh, that, God, was, that, was something that was one else. of them. Yeah. Right. I'll listen to the episode and find out. By the way, <laughs> consider helping us. If you like what we do, we could use your support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a Patreon account. We have a PayPal account and other things as well. Uh, and today, earlier yesterday, I, I was able to bring Rich Condit here uh, due to our patrons who support us. So we don't charge for our content. If you'd like to help us, we'd love it. We'd be eternally grateful to you. If you have questions and comments, twim at microbe.tv. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. From Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Pleasure. Thank you. Piacere. Hey. <laughs> From the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michelle Swanson. Thank you, thank you and thank much. you for coming. And from the Bloomberg, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and School of Medicine. Is that correct? That's correct. Arturo Casadeval, thank you so much. Thank you, Vincent. I love talking to you. Thank you, Vincent. And uh, we really appreciate it. I want to we thank could, We could do one of this with wine, see what happens. <laughs> well, I asked for wine. He didn't bring it. Where, <laughs> Let's see what would happen. Where did it go? Where did it go? I want to thank ASM. It's a mixed microbial end product. Right. I asked Michael what he was having for lunch the other day, and he said, it's a mixed microbial end <laughs> Those product. Those pickles. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for letting us do this here and take their space. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank our producer, uh, Chris Condian over there, our cameraman, Ray Ortega. I have been working uh, with these two for many years, and they are awesome. And you should know that tw ed 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 Ray edits every episode of TWIM for us and takes out all the, uh, the bad parts. So thank you very much. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks to the audience, and thanks to those online uh, who are asking questions. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in microbiology. Thank you. Thank you. Can we start? They tell you to put your chin right there. <laughs> I became an ASM member in 1981. 95? Um, since 2008. I joined ASM in 1974. I've been an ASM member for 41 years. I first became a member in 1989. Seems like 
all my career. I'm willing to bet it's a decade. My first ASM was 1993. I still have a picture of me holding the program open, sitting on the hotel room bed, really excited because for the first time ever I saw my name in print associated with microbiology. When I was a graduate student at Purdue in 1980, it was the thing. I mean, if you were going to be a microbiologist, you joined the ASM. It was just really that simple. ASM is very special to me because I became a member in 2002, and when I first attended the, the meeting at Salt Lake City, Utah, I met my PhD thesis mentor, Dr. Arturo Casadevall. And so ASM kind of introduced me to the PhD world. Definitely the most important thing is that ASM has provided me with a graduate fellowship. So they've helped support me during my graduate training. Um, in addition, I've gotten a lot of networking opportunities and I've met a lot of really great people through ASM. And we can share our work and connect and they can teach me things that I don't know and I can teach them things that they don't know. And just that partnership and working together, that's what scientists do, to share your work. And it's the most exciting thing to learn about new projects. ASM has actually done a whole lot of work and given me the kind of exposure I've not, I wouldn't have had if I'm not a member of ASM. Many brains are better than one. So, great thing. It's a really member-driven organization. I love that. I've always loved that. Could make the bigger, the better, the, the more the merrier. You want to do microbiology? Become a member.